35. Um, talks about membrane transport. This is what your sim lab is on. So usually this is a yes. Yeah, Yes, yes, and that's kind of one of the shitty parts about this class is how it's so fast in the summer is I will literally test you exam on the day before some material, uh, which would be kind of rough. That's why I try to keep the days before materials short and give you a review period so you don't have as much stuff to digest that night. Okay, so this is your sim lab stuff. Hopefully, you'll be able to conceptualize a little bit better because of the sim lab. Um, if you have questions on the sim lab as you're going through, this is a good time to review back. Almost all those figures in that PowerPoint that I skipped through really fast in lab was because they're going to show up again right here. So we talked about body fluid compartments on um, so intracellular versus extracellular. Again, this is kind of a nice, I like this cartoon picture a little better. So you have your blood plasma here, interstitial fluid, your extracellular tissues in this purple, and then intracellular is ICF right here. So we're, how do we move the fluid between these compartments? That's what we're going to ask in this chapter. We're going to answer that. Okay. So, one of the best ways to do it is through transport across membranes, is through active and passive processes. Some are protein mediated. This is a nice little breakdown. It separates them. Um, you can also make like a table and kind of be like, what's active, what's passive. I like, ways to do that too. Um, there's a lot of different diagrams to make this up. If you're a visual learner, this is where you live. Um, so, we're talking active processes on this side. These are things that take energy, that is the definition of active, it takes energy to transport this. Passive does not take energy. You have this kind of bubble here for protein mediated, which is exactly what it sounds like. It needs some sort of protein. In membrane transport, think of proteins like a door or a window. It requires, it's an opening for things to get to, for special things. All this stuff on the other side, these things can walk through walls. Either an X Men or something. Okay. <coughs> Just have a flow chart. It's very similar to these things. If you look, um, it's the same stuff that we're talking about here. A little bit more specific here. Um, it's a flow chart version of this table. It talks about the same kind of stuff. Okay. So diffusion. Diffusion is kind of our overarching, passive, non-protein mediated transport. This is the simplest way for things to go. I use the far example in lab. It's the best way to do it. Um, it's a passive process. Things go from high concentrations to low concentrations. As it's run on, I'm going to hit over and over again. Um, the net movement, it moves until the concentration is equal. When the concentration is equal, things are still moving. Do not forget that phenomenon. That will be on the lab practical. There's a test on there that's like this. Net movement of concentration is, is we have net movement until the concentration is equal at equilibrium. When we are equal, it is still movement. We no longer have net movement. If we change one this way and one this way, one minus one is zero. So there's no net movement, but things still have movement. The body never stops moving. That's the kind of hemophoresis we talked about instead of hemostasis. Okay. Diffusion, technically speaking, is considered a rapid process because we're going really short distances. Um, Kind of that phrase is, I think, is very hilarious because rapid everything's rapid over short distances. That's the whole point of speed, but never. Um, relatively to these other processes, diffusion is faster than them, just because it's so smart. It's relatively fast. It is directly related to temperature. Um, so if you're in a hot car, that part's going to dissipate faster than if it's in a cold car. Same thing in your body. Okay. Inversely related to molecular size and weight. So the bigger the molecule is, the slower it diffuses. The hotter it is, the faster it diffuses. Um, and then it can pass the DNA over to the process that we're doing. Okay. So diffusion is a non-charged molecule. Ions also move through a similar process like diffusion. They move down instead of a concentration gradient, down what's called an electrochemical gradient, which we'll get into a lot more neural communication. But just know the gradients don't have to be concentration. They can be other stuff too. It just has to go from high to low for it to be a passive process. Okay. <coughs> This is a kind of nice example here. Um, we have our different ions balanced on this thing. So here's our graph, ion concentration on this side, where we're at here, intracellular, extracellular, blood plasma. I would want you to focus on here is sodium and potassium for right now. You can see that we maintain in our bodies a constant disequilibrium, right? We always, inside the body, have more potassium. Outside the cells, have more sodium. 
The reason we do this is so when we want to do diffusion, we want to have that passive process, it can happen quicker than the active process of pushing them across ways. We spend a ton of energy keeping ourselves out of balance so that for certain certain instances, action potential in this case, we need to go into balance, cats run really quickly down the grade. Okay. There's studies out there that estimate right around 30% of all the ATP in your body is used just to keep these two ions disbalanced like this. Run through what's called a sodium potassium pump. We run that thing so much, it takes like 30% of all the energy in our body. Just to do this, we can then use our brains to go the other way. Okay. okay. Transport by diffusion. So you see this here. This is a really simple option. So we have a high concentration here, low concentration great, uh, there. This is what we call the membrane is permeable to the solute. Um, so it can go across, it can permeate. So it goes this way, this is one that way. We have net flow going that way. If we have something that's impermeable, you're going to say a non penetrating solvent or solute, solute or that. Uh, it's impermeable, it cannot cross. So even though we're at different concentrations, the membrane is stopping those. You can see these bubbles are too big to go through those little gaps. So it can't go through. So there is no diffusion of these molecules. Um, some formulas down here. We're not going to get to that. I didn't have that answer. Okay. Worry about the penetrating and non penetrating. That's the crucial thing. <coughs> Little study slide that kind of goes over some general things I just talked about. Okay. Fixed law of the diffusion. I will test on fixed law of diffusion. The rate of diffusion is approximately equal to the surface area times the concentration gradient, times the membrane permeability. Those are the three things that impact how fast we can diffuse a molecule. If a membrane is more permeable to something, think of it like having more doors. If you have more doors in a room, people can leave faster. So if there's like a fire going on in here, we need to get out. If I put eight doors in, people can run through faster than I put one door in. Concentration gradient. If I put 100 people in this room, light a fire, they're going to move out faster than if there was five people in this room and I lit out fire because we're going to push them through the door with that, that concentration gradient. And the surface area, that's like a bigger door, right? So if I put a garage door instead of a normal door there, we're going to run through faster. We're trying to get out. We're trying to diffuse. It's also important to know. Yes. Can you expand on that? No, 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 no. It won't be that. It'll, it'll, I'll put like, it'll be four things. I mean, which one of these does not in fixed law of diffusion? I'll be like, I don't know, something that's not one of these <laughs> terms. Right. Pretty literally just know what's in fixed law of diffusion. I'm going to be like, no, multiply this by this. Yeah. You won't need a calculator. Yeah. Okay. Uh, membrane permeability has to do with lipid solubility and molecular size. So our membrane, like we talked about, is that phospholipid bilayer with its polar heads and its nonpolar tails. The polar heads are out here just because that's what's touching water. We pass through membranes if we are nonpolar. Nonpolar things like to pass through membranes. This is the hard part. This is easy to be passed back. This fails the hard part. So membrane permeability is equal to how lipid soluble it is over molecular size. So if you're more lipid soluble, we're more membrane permeable. If we have a smaller molecular size, we're more membrane permeable because that's what's in the denominator. So big polar things don't cross. They kind of find a way to it. Large and charged, they cannot pass. Large and charged because it's polar and it's too big. All fatty things we can walk through. Okay. Here's some more fixed law diffusion stuff. So how it, if you do this, this is what happens. Kind of look at that if you want to go through. If I made you do math, make me do it. Okay. Um, so here's an example of your diffusion here. So which of these spaces? would have um, the larger surface area and therefore more capacity. Right or left? A or B? A. You have so much more to interact with. Um, whereas if you have these huge spaces like in your alveoli compared to a smaller denser space. Okay. More volume per surface area, more surface area per volume. We want the surface area. This will hold more stuff. This will move more stuff. Okay. Um, practical example of this for people who nurses want to be nurses in the room. Um, dialysis machines. Dialysis machines are essentially your kidney outside your body. It's all run through diffusion. 
this is an oversimplified version of this. It's actually from the people that used to make, I don't know if they're using the company anymore. They used to make um, dialysis machines. Really. This is what you show patients when they come in. It's really simple. You push the blood through here. We squirt the bad stuff out here through diffusion. We put the good stuff into this way through diffusion, and then we get the blood out back into your body. That's it. Just crosses the membrane without being pushed. It naturally flows from high to low concentrations. Osmosis. So we've been talking about diffusion of molecules within a solvent. So we're talking like we're talking here, like your urea in your blood. Now we're going to talk about the actual fluid moving. So osmosis is a fancy word that essentially just means diffusion of water. Technically not diffusion, because diffusion by definition has to be a solute moving and water is a solvent, but it's the same exact process. Um, if one of the professors in here, they'd be like, don't call it that, but it is that. You know, yeah, sorry, I'm going to get too deep. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, it is the movement of water in a similar manner of diffusion. We'll talk about molar molality versus osmolality, hydrostatic osmo osmotic pressure, isomolality, all these things. We'll talk about this is kind of an intro slide to osmosis. Okay. Osmosis and osmotic pressure. So water is a polar molecule. It is partly charged. However, it is small. Our membranes, it doesn't naturally cross the membrane, but all of our membranes in our body are somewhat permeable to water. We have little pore, what they're called pores, in our bodies um, that are essentially proteins that let water flow through. Some have more than others, but your membranes are selectively permeable to water. You can flow a little bit of water back and forth through your through your cellular membrane. Okay. So let's take a little walk here through what we call osmotic pressure. So we're sitting here, so we have glucose on this side. We have a selective, selectively permeable membrane. Glucose cannot pass this membrane. It's too large, it's too charged. Okay, so we're here, we're at steady state situation. We are in a plunger. We pull the plunger back. We now have an equal concentration book. We have an equal, like, see how it's spread out, same. We still have more concentration here, so the water wants to flow this way because the um, actual solute can't move. The solvent will move instead. So this side will, will push water that way to decrease this. Um, and it actually creates a force here. So that creates a force pushing this way. So to stop the water from doing that, you'd have to push the plunger the other way to make that force back. Um, so now the glucose can't move back. So you have water on this side. So it actually creates a force, which we'll see come up in a minute through osmotic pressure. This movement of water actually produces a force or so much energy. It's going from high to low, I guess. Okay. Molarity versus osmolarity. Molarity, if you take it in the basic chemistry class, is the number of molecules per a volume of liquid. Osmolarity is the number of particles over a volume of solution. It's a very similar concept. Here's the easiest way to differentiate the two. Okay, We have salt, NaCl. We have one mole of salt. We put it in one liter of water. That's a one molar salt solution. Salt is NaCl. We put it in water, it splits apart. That is a two molality solution because we have two separate molecules. Even though it's still one mole of the salt, we have two separate molecules that split up, so we get twice the much. So once this breaks apart, water and solutes, when we determine osmosis, they work through molality, not through molarity. So if you have this salt solution, we're going to naturally push water that way because it's much more concentrated now, even though we have one and one, it's actually not built into two one. That's why this is what happens here. Okay. So osmosis is a net diffusion of water down its own concentration gradient. Hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure is the same as osmotic pressure, is the force based on that dropped out of the previous slide. Okay. okay, this is where it comes up in your real life. Okay. Here is our red blood cell. We had this the same diagram in the lab. I'm going to walk through it more here. Okay. Conicity is the phenomenon we're looking at here. Conicity is not an actual measurement. It's just a relative relationship. If something is isotonic, it is the same tonicity between what we're looking at and the stuff that's around it. If it is hypotonic, or hypotonic sorry, the solution on the outside has less tonicity, has less stuff in it than the inside. Hyper is the exact opposite of that. 
hyper meaning there's more stuff in the outside environment than the inside environment. Okay, we're gonna have red blood cell here. We put it in an isotonic solution, plop, it's gonna keep the same shape because the water is the same movement in as out. These red blood cells, water would be a penetrating, um, what is it called? Penetrating solute to this because um, it's a solvent. But like the salt, there's glucose around it, is now. Okay. So this would be your instance of that 0.9 saline solution that you see in IVs. That's an isotonic situation. Okay. If we put that red blood cell into something that's more like distilled water, right? It has less, it's less hypotonic. The solution is there's less dots on the outside there. The water sees that it's a higher concentration of stuff inside the cell, so it wants to balance that out. So it's going to push itself inside the cell. The cell is going to swell up. This is why we don't put water in IV units because the cells would start to explode because they'd swell up so much with water. Okay. I'll show you examples of this in a second, but a non penetrating solute here with a hypertonic solution. The exact opposite is going to happen. The water on the inside is going to say, oh, there's more concentration on the outside. I need to go balance that out. I'm going to leave my cell. It's going to shrink up and go to the outside. Where do we see this? Well, this is your genie, your best friend, Abby, in our pool on the Taylor Swift swan, because, of course, we got to have that. Um, so are their hands shrivel up in a pool? What does this say about the tonicity of the pool compared to their A, right. It is a hypertonic solution. The pool has greater tonicity than their fingers. This is why your fingers shrivel up because the water in here is like, oh, there's less concentration stuff out there, so I'm going to go into the pool that way. Okay. Um, and the reason I said that that is because the salt in the pool, the chlorine in the pool, that kind of stuff, so it's leaving your body. There's more water in your cells than the actual water in the pool, which is kind of weird to think about. If you were swimming in like a distilled water solution, which I could do that, get a lot of money. Um, but you could do that. This would happen. You'd actually reduce your, you'd actually like swell up like almost like edema. And if you had a perfect saline solution, you would never be able to swim up. Okay. Um, Dead Sea is like 13% salt or something. It's like the craziest. Right. Yeah. Crazy. So you can like float on it, right? Did yeah. you notice your fingers like shrip, shrip up right away? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it hurts. Right, it's salt. So the salt's reacting with your skin and also all the water's leaving it. Um, so yeah, good. That, that's awesome that you were there. Good. Okay, we'll put it on the slide. It'll be if that question too. Um, um, so here's just a review of all that stuff. Um, the practical uses. So here's the nurse with her IV solution. Okay. This is where it gets confusing. Bear with me a bit here. Um, this is a little more complicated of the phenomenon. And I'll, I'll be bouncing back into these next four slides. I'll bounce back and forth quite a bit. Um, if we're confused by it, I might have to post a lecture explaining things. Okay. So <clears throat> we have this situation in your life. This is where you're sitting. Don't worry about the plus here. You're sitting at 1,400, 300, at 600 ICF, ECF total body of your solute. You have a total body volume of 5 liters in your body. Our first step, what we're going to do is we're going to add 2 liters both of them salt solution and a urea solution at this osmolarity into your ECF. So your exercise, we're just going to like put it non-IV. We're just going to put it like IM just like stick it right into your body. Okay. We're going to do the salts first in this example. So salt is a non-penetrating solution. We cannot cross salts across the membrane because the R molecule has an ionic charge that doesn't cross the membrane. So we put that into the ECF. What happens there? Well, we add that 500 mils of water and nothing moves. We don't move because we're not moving the volume in your body. The volume stays like this. And the osmolarity of each of these stays like 200. If we're doing the urea, we put that in. The urea is a penetrating solution, so all of our um, body stuff moves. And so this number is changing. We get 258 to this spot instead of just the 300 and just the 500 and one. That goes to ECF and ICF. So we balance out the five liters at this osmolarity because it's a penetrating solution. Okay. So 
if you're going to define osmolarity and tonicity, you need to assume that all intracellular solutes are non-penetrating. The cells are already in your cells and don't move. That's why they're there. Compare osmolarities before the cells exposed and after. <coughs> tonicity of the solution describes the volume chain in the cell in equilibrium. Determine the tonicity by comparing non-trained solute concentrations of the cell and the solution compared to the penetrating. So this is what we're talking about here. So what changes if it's penetrating versus non-penetrating? Then you can define it as um, which of these ones we're talking about is the definition. Also to know that the solution changes if it's hypoosmotic or hypoosmotic. Okay. Here's our graph that can be pretty confusing. Okay, so this is again the osmolarity, which is the actual measured number versus tonicity, which is just the relative to the outside environment. If something is hypo in a hypotonic environment, it is always going to be hypoosmotic. Not the same for isoosmotic, hyperosmotic. If it's isoosmotic, it can be anything except for hypertonic. Hyperosmotic can be all three. Which we just go back to this phenomenon, which is why I have to use these rules to see which one it is. Okay. Here's some clinical examples of those things. Uh, so each two examples here, because we want to look at something that's hypertonic, isoosmotic. That's your 0.9% saline solution that you put in your body. <coughs> Dextrose is the clinical. Use of glucose, it's actually have to make it into a different kind of sugar that it changes the glucose in our body. So dextrose, think of it as a sugar solution, sugar being a non-penetrating solution, saline also, that's the balance there. Um, don't worry about the stuff. So it's a hyperosmotic solution, but it's an actual isotonic solution because the saline is still in there, so we have more stuff, more osmolarity, but it still has a saline isotonic. Water is a hypotonic solvent, but we have the dextrose in there, so it's actually the same Isoosmotic, based on this balance of these two things, makes it isoosmotic, but hypotonic. We cut the saline solution in half. We're now in a hypoosmotic. That means immediately hypotonic. Just hypo and that stuff immediately. Okay? Hyperosmotic, here we have the sugar and the half saline. So now it's a hyperosmotic solution, but it's still hypotonic because the saline is at half where we want to be. Okay? So that's an actual function there. So you got to separate your penetrating versus non penetrating solutes. Transfer process is all through bulk, bulk flow, so we just push things in general, and then transfer processes are selectively permeable. Uh, so some membranes are permeable versus other. We'll talk about each of these in this next couple of sections. Okay. So that was the key thing else we have to talk about in this flow. So what we do, we just kind of naturally walk into all of the bulk flow plants and all this stuff. So now we'll talk membrane proteins. We have integral proteins versus peripheral proteins. Integral means they're within the membrane. They go through part of it or all of it. Peripheral just means they're sitting on one side. Okay, so they'll separate into those things. See memory transfer proteins, sertral proteins, enzymes. We'll go back. We're gonna walk through all this in the next couple slides. Uh, we just kind of go back and see it. Okay. So here's the two easy separators: a channel protein. They create what we can think of like a water-filled pore. It's essentially that's like your open doorway. So certain things can pass through channels. Um, they're going to be specific to what passes through, just based on the shape of them. Um, so you can have like a sodium channel. Potassium isn't going to flow through a sodium channel, only sodium. Likewise, other things you might have a potassium channel. It's specific for potassium because these are proteins. We know that proteins are specific, and so this is a channel that they can walk. This right here is an open channel, so it's just sitting like an open doorway. There's no lock. There's no doorman. Nothing more about that. You just walk right through the door. It fits your shape. Okay. Gated channels, we'll see those over again. Um, certain things will open gated channels. Um, we'll talk about that a lot more when we talk about neural function, um, action potential. If you think of a gated channel, like a doorway with an actual door in it, something has to open the door. Sometimes it can be a certain voltage on one side. Sometimes it can be a certain concentration. Sometimes it's a physical thing that pushes it open before the door. So the gate is like a gate. It's a doorway. So you have this doorway and then the door in there that can open a closed. Here's a cartoon version of what that protein is. Okay. All right. Those are channel proteins. Now we have carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are something that actually holds your hand to the membrane. They actually guide you through breath. They push you from one side to another. Um, they usually function kind of like this sort of thing. So like the proteins on the outside of my hands and it opens to the outside, grabs you, and pushes you through the other side. Just like a kind of a flopping with door like that. So you'll see this kind of animation over and over again. Exactly like that. 
So one example of that is what's called a uniport carrier. Think of the name uniport. It ports one thing, like the glute 4 transporter is a uniport. It takes glucose, it pushes it from one side to the other. <coughs> That's uniport. Another thing could be a co-transporter, which two versus that. A thin porter moves two things at the same time. So right here we have the sodium glucose sim porter. It pushes both of them down the concentration gradient one way. Antiporter. This is like the sodium potassium one. It moves one thing one way, the other thing the other way. Think of it like a rotating, like a rotating door outside of a fancy hotel, right? You walk one way and the other dude walks the other way. So grabs one, pushes it the other way. There's actually a lot of these in our body that will use the it's like a high concentration training of one here and a low here. We'll use that energy to push the other one the opposite way up the concentration gradient. We'll see a lot of those when we get into more of these things. Okay. These are all examples of what we call facilitated diffusion. The protein is what's facilitating the diffusion. So all these things are not, this actually is, but these things are non-powered. They're just floating with their concentration gradient. So they have to have the doorway to do that. That's facilitated Diffusion, same action of motion, we just need someone to kind of help us out a little bit. So that protein is the carrier molecule, that's what's doing the work, it's kind of doing that flip-flop thing, but it's still going high to low concentration. It's not actually requiring energy, it's just going down to high to low. Okay. Um, you'll see me say this, I always said it several times in class, glute, I say glute 4 over and over again, like when you talk about your butt. So glute is a glucose transporter, glute 4 is a glucose transporter in your muscles, so that's kind of the one we always just go to. This is a kinesiology class. Glute 1 is in your neural tissue. Glute 2 is in your liver. Glute 3 is only in fetuses. I mean, you can, it's all different kinds of glute transporters. We use that a lot, especially when we're talking about diabetes. So these membrane transporters are proteins, so they do get saturated. So in certain instances, they can only handle so much at a time. Uh, they're also competitive here. So like, here's an example of a glute transporter. Um, maltose. It's going to stick in there. It's a competitive inhibitor because it's a disaccharide. It's only shaped for one sugar. You can see there it's got the shape for the one glucose. So we put two in there, that's competitively inhibiting it because it clicked into that active site. Pitartin is actually on the quiz today, I think. A competitive inhibitor. We clicked into the active sites, we can't run this anymore. So they are proteins. They function through those four things. We talked about proteins, affinity, specificity, competitive competition, that kind of stuff. Okay. You can hear that no matter how high the protein concentration goes, you get saturated up. So much for each, even if these membrane transports. Okay. Just like a doorway, you can only have so many people walk through at the same time. Okay. <coughs> so we're actually going to dive a little bit into glute 4 and glucose transport a bit. Uh, so this kind of ties into uh, the metabolism and stuff. So glucose on the outside, we want to get into its cells, so we can run a glycolysis. The first step of glycolysis is this process here. We have a higher concentration of glucose on the outside. If we run it inside, uh, we're going to use up all this glucose in our glycolysis, so the calcification is actually going to get lower on the inside. So the reason we actually what we do is we attach a phosphate to it, change it in what's called G6P glucose 6 phosphate, and that cannot cross through this glute transporter. So then we can have a lower concentration of glucose on the inside and not lose it down its concentration gradient going out of the cell through that same transporter because we're sticking on this guy that's not going to let it go through. Okay, it's kind of like a scrub. Here's some examples. We're going to use these where we talk about, especially the sodium potassium pump. No one calls it the sodium potassium ATPA, something like that. that sodium potassium pump. Um, we might mention these in four positions examples of antiporter, uniporter, and antiporter. Okay. Most will hit that. So here's the sodium potassium pump. We'll do two or three more slides. Okay, so sodium potassium pump here. So we have, this is going, this is powered. ATP is active transport. We're pushing things against their concentration gradient. It's always drawn in this little shape that we have three circles and two triangles because we fit three sodiums and two potassiums. So it moves two potassiums, three sodium. So the test question that will never be glee, I think it's like 42 or something on the test. What's the number of potassium that's pushed? What's the number? What's the ratio of potassium to sodium pushed by the ATPase? So that's sodium potassium pump. Two, three. No, which one's which? Three sodiums, two potassium. <coughs> so we're starting here. So we have three high affinity spots for sodium, two low affinity spots for potassium. We like sodium better than potassium. Just 
how it actually works. They are specific to both of those. So those three sodiums click in. We push this ATP, use our phosphate up, use the energy, push on the outside. We then go to the outside, grab the sodiums, push them back down the concentration gradient, and release that phosphate. We use the energy to push both these because they're going the wrong way to reset the um, so I always remember this, we have our cell that we're putting potassium pump. Okay. Um, is pushing across the concentration gradient. So which way does sodium potassium pump? We have sodium going this way, potassium going this way. It is pushing, it's energized, it takes ATP. So you know because it's energized, it's going the wrong way. So at rest, after this thing's functioning, we have sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside. See, that's, we're keeping that dynamic equilibrium because we ran this thing. How do we remember this? Anyone watched old like Adam West Batman? The theme song goes na 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 Batman. Okay, so when we're at rest, we're not using this na 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 na. Batman is outside of Gotham, at home, and is at Wayne Manor. Okay. When we need them, and we run this out, which we'll get to in neurophysiology, we need Batman in town, we then run sodium inside of town. So sodium always gets pumped out, so you know potassium goes the other way because we want Batman out of town. It's a really weird analogy, but it's so dumb you'll remember it because I'm being an idiot right now. Okay? Works for me with my freshman professor taught me it. Okay. Here's some examples of antiporter, symporter, as we're going through. Um, so that's the kind of slide here. It's like a revolving door. Antiporter is that single revolving door, and then you have this huge one where everyone's going the same way. That's a symporter. <coughs> Secondary active transport. You know what? This is a good place to stop. We're going to stop here. We'll start up with this slide again on Monday. Um, you want to give it that? Yeah. Yeah. So, how it's actually working. Yeah, right. Where this comes into effect is, and we'll get into this, I think, chapter nine, is a neural cell. Okay, we have our neuron with our axon on this side, then right down here. Okay. Our neurons, when you fire a signal from, like you said, like if I, if I hit you in the face, you need to hit me back, right? You need to send that signal, like, oh, this fucker just hit me. I'm going to hit him back. Smack. Okay? To do that signal, we got to run from here to here. So we start at this axon body, we got a signal going this way. The way we do that, we run an electrochemical gradient, and we run charges down this whole thing. We do the charges through salt. Don't worry about this. We'll get into this later. But it's just been kind of giving me background. Okay? So at a rest, we have a natural higher amount of sodium on the outside and potassium on the inside. This is what we talk about, the sodium potassium pump. It keeps it. We spend a ton of energy keeping this how we don't want it. This is not a natural setting. We want these to flow the other way. The reason why we spend so much energy doing that is because when we need to send a nerve impulse, we need to be really quick. Diffusion is really quick, so we can run through transporters this way really fast. So you know, when we're at rest, when we're not functioning, no, 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 Batman is outside of the cell. Okay? So you know, when we're steady state at rest, we're keeping our dynamic unequilibrium outside of the cell. Sodium out, potassium in. You now know the sodium potassium pump is what maintains this because it pushes across the concentration gradient. So we have to push sodium out of here to keep this so we can at rest be like this. Whoa, it is. Yeah, so there's a little bit, so you can think of it like, right, and then there's like one K, there's like one sodium in here, a bunch of Ks. Okay, this is how we maintain it. We want to be perfect one to one. We want to have every potassium, every sodium, we want to have the same amounts, because that's where we would be for, for homeostatic, we'd be the same. That's where concentration gradient end gets there. We run our sodium potassium pump to keep us out of balance. So when we need to go back into balance and change the charge, it's really quick and easy. Which is why we put no 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 out. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Good job, team. Have a good weekend. If you have questions, email me. Um, I will see you all on Monday, and there will be a pre-lecture test that day. Uh, a couple of you aren't going to be here. I'll email you the password for the test. They're due at noon, the day of the lecture, but I think they're open. You can do them afterward. They just tell me, take points off. This person did it late, and I won't. You can do them whenever. 
I'll just send you the password down. Really? Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's so good. I want to go there so bad. Yeah. Right. It's so cool that you just get like float there at that. It's awesome. Yep. 